Thank you everybody for coming. The, the talk today is about um, heart health in, during the pandemic. My name is Tyler Scholes. I'm one of the cardiology fellows and I'll give a little bit more context about, um, not a ton because it doesn't really matter that much what a fellow is. Just getting started here. As I my name is Tyler Scholes. I'm one of the cardiology fellows and so for context about that, you know, you do four years of medical school then you have to do three years of internal medicine residency or kind of on the job training as a physician. You get board certified and then you have to do another three years for cardiology and I'm in that uh, first year of my my three years for cardiology here at Good Sam. So I'm originally from Pocatello. This won't take very long. I promise you the talk is not about me. Uh, it's in the southeast corner of Idaho and I attended Idaho State University. Here's just a little picture here. You'll notice that these photos all kind of look similar. I went to medical school at Pacific Northwest, University of Osteopathic Medicine. Here's a little photo of Yakima, Washington. I don't know if anybody is from that area. And then I did my residency here at uh, Good Samaritan at Corvallis, a place that all of you are quite familiar with. And I'll pause for a second. I saw Jennifer posted the, there is a little survey if you could uh, fill that out after the the discussion that would be very helpful it just gives feedback for further talks and ways that we can improve it so go ahead and get started i think there's kind of three uh big points that i wanted to make about the presentation in general and hopefully i'll be able to give people some tips on uh things for at home as well but i think my big points were what are we talking about when we say heart disease what contributes to it and then I think probably the thing that you're all most interested in is, you know, how can I live the healthiest heart life that I can? So I'll try to address all these three here. There'll be a little bit of discussion about uh, some anatomy and some about what causes uh, heart disease, but not super focused on it for everybody to have a little bit of context about that. if. Who unfortunately or a loved one ever suffers from anything like this, I think it's nice to at least have some context about what we're talking about when people throw around different terms. So uh, just kind of a first little photo here. So here's obviously the heart. Uh, these blue vessels here are veins. This is your aorta, this red one here. The point here is that there's three big arteries that lie on top of the heart. These are the ones that we're really referring to when we talk about uh, people getting heart disease is there's this large one coming right down the front. It's called the left anterior descending artery. But heart disease is really this buildup of cholesterol over time in these large arteries on top of the heart. There's a lot of little ones that go down in, but really the ones that we're referring to are, are these big arteries that over a long period of time of high cholesterol, um, diabetes, et cetera, puts you at risk of accumulating uh, this plaque here. So this shows a normal artery here with blood just going through and then this one obviously has some uh, plaque disease here showing that narrowing in that artery. This is just another kind of close up of the of what I was trying to exhibit there. As I mentioned, normal artery on top of the heart and then one that actually has accumulated this cholesterol and fatty uh, calcium kind of plaque here. So, I mean, why do we even care about that this happens in our bodies? The biggest one is that it's, it is a potential cause of chest pain. So sometimes when people come in, there can be a lot of different reasons why people do get chest discomfort. You know, anything from the skin, the bones, the muscle, the lungs, all of that, all throughout the chest can cause discomfort. But one of the big ones is the scariest, one of the scariest ones is from the heart. When that blockage that we were looking at before, if it, starts to, I'm going to pop back, if it starts to get blocking more than 70% of this kind of area here, that's actually when people usually come in with symptoms when they're pushing themselves, they start to get discomfort in their chest or feel short of breath. That's a potential cause of that. And this is from decades and decades of um, time. It doesn't, you know, these things don't happen overnight. They're from, not even just from uh, lifestyle choices. There's a lot of portion of genetics that contributes to this too, but it does represent a long period of time of that accumulation here. The other big implication with heart disease is that the big scary one is people having a heart attack. 
So really the mechanism of that is, as we showed before that plaque in that artery, if for whatever reason there's a lot of different ones, it becomes what we call is unstable and it breaks open, your body actually recognizes that is very inflammatory. It's very irritating to the heart and it will form a blood clot or it has the potential to in that area. And when a blood clot forms in, a, in an artery that's supplying blood flow down to that portion of the heart, you know, past this point, there's no further blood getting down to that portion of the heart. And that's what people come in with with that you know, severe chest pain that they're having is because there's actually heart tissue that's dying at that time because there's not good blood flow there. And obviously, um, you know, it's all well and good that if somebody comes in with that, we, we have ways that we can fix that. We can put a stent in an area and we can take care of you and care for those people that come in like that. But I would prefer that no one ever has to suffer from this event. So we, we do our best to, to prevent these things in the first place by live in a healthy life as best as we can and we'll talk a little bit more about what causes that as well so the risk factors for accumulating heart disease quite a few of them we have smoking diabetes uh, obesity or being overweight high blood pressure uh, high cholesterol and then family history as i kind of mentioned these are really the the biggest ones we get concerned about and obviously some of these um, are ones that we ourselves can make a big difference in. There's there's medications that can help with these things, but eating healthy, being active, and all of that can be very um, preventing this. So uh, the American Heart Association actually had published this, it's called Life Simple 7. I don't know if anybody is familiar with it or if anybody is, any physician has mentioned it to you before. But it was these targeted uh, seven different areas that people can pursue and try to optimize to minimize their risk of any heart disease in the future. And as you can see here, they're not super complicated, you know, being more active, cholesterol control, eating a healthier diet, controlling your blood pressure, losing weight, uh, reducing blood sugar, as well as uh, stopping smoking. So these are kind of the seven things that all. Uh, I'll touch on while we're going through this, and then I'll hopefully give a little bit more about tips and things that you can do at home. I did talk with a couple of, um, I have a few friends who are personal trainers as well as physical therapists who provided some recommendations about at-home things, but I'll be honest with you, they weren't any uh, groundbreaking kind of activities. It was mostly uh, being healthy and walking and such, but we'll talk a little bit more when we get there. I tried to go in order here, so First one is uh, being more active and pause for just a second and say, you know, if there are, as I mentioned at the beginning, if there's any questions at all, feel free to uh, put them in the chat and I can address them either as we're going or uh, kind of address all of them at the end. But being active is one of those simple seven. This one's kind of busy here in regards to the information on the slide. But this is, uh, I thought it'd be helpful to get these references. Like as like I mentioned, the American Heart Association had published this information. And really the recommended amount of exercise you can see here is about 150 minutes of moderate or 75 of vigorous. And we're talking, you know, you're breaking a sweat, you're breathing a little bit hard and kind of aiming for these, these goals here. So if you even did, I mean, if you exercised uh, 10 minutes a day, or 15 minutes, I guess that one would be easier. You know, you'd need about five days of relatively vigorous activity, if only that 15 minutes to kind of get to your goals. And I, you know, even among um, some of the physicians I know, I don't, I don't know if they actually get to these, to these levels, but I think these are things to, to strive and goals to, to look towards. You can see that uh, the recommendations are in regards to both muscle strength, you know, if we're talking about exercise bands or free weights. I think it, I honestly think in regards to exercise, it's very personalized. You know, I don't ever sit somebody down and say, this is exactly the best thing for you, or this is exactly what you should do. I think it's what you find works in your schedule, what you enjoy doing. Some people really like to um, go to a gym or go to classes, do yoga, be around a community, and other people like to do their own thing and 
you know, either run by themselves or walk or, uh, you know, either just walk their dog, walk with their loved one. But I think whatever you find you're able to consistently do is honestly the best thing for you. And you can see here, this is probably not applicable to a lot of the people here, but maybe for their uh, children, we usually recommend about 60 minutes of activity. There's some tips here on the side that they uh, go through. I really do think the biggest one is um, just even starting uh, an activity. A lot of the time, the hardest is, is just getting at that in the first place. And once people do make it a habit, it's it's not even a question of should I go do it anymore? It's It's just part of your routine which I think makes it a little bit easier for uh, people to grasp. There's some information here about exercise, which I think is pretty interesting. And this is there's a few different studies that talk about the benefits of exercise. These go through uh, your risk of heart disease, depending on how much activity you're doing. And it's actually quite interesting. Once you get to a very, very large amount of exercise, there has been shown to be some detriment. But I, I'm talking, you know, ultra marathon runners, people running hundreds of miles uh, when they go out and run. So not the not the typical kind of exercise, but you can see even just from a baseline, a small amount of exercise and be it running or walking can be very beneficial and reduce your risk of heart disease significantly with a small amount of you know frequency as well as not a lot of distance here. I think this one actually shows a little bit better here because I know it's hard because some people um, have restrictions in walking, be it from arthritis or uh, walking assistive devices or anything. But you can actually see here the equivalence. So if you were to go running for only five minutes, you actually reduce. This is not just cardiovascular disease. This is all cause. Uh, any reason why you would die is is what this chart shows. If you were to run for five minutes a day, you reduce that chance by approximately about 10 percent. If you were to walk for 15 minutes a day, you would almost reduce your all cause mortality by about 10%, which is quite significant. We're talking a lot of um, extra healthy years gained from a pretty small amount of um, activity, honestly. And as you can see, you know, you can get the equivalent benefit. There's a rapid amount of benefit gained from running, which I, I recognize that um, is very limiting on on people and you know, once you get to a certain age is probably not the safest thing for you anyways. But even for 20 minutes of running, you know, there's about a 30 percent reduction and that would take you approximately an hour to an hour and a half of walking. Um, to get that same benefit, so if you're able to, it, it does behoove you to do the more vigorous activity. But as I mentioned, I recognize that that's not feasible for everybody. And if you're able to even walk for an hour a day, I mean, that's a significant quarter to 30 percent reduction in your overall um, chance of passing away from anything, which is quite significant. And it's been shown that um, in regards to exercise, there really is not um, medications or um, different interventions that we've had. Exercise is the one that shows the biggest benefit across everything and helping cholesterol, helping blood pressure, people live longer, people have better quality of life throughout their life when they exercise routinely. So I think it's something to really uh, focus and consider on. And as I mentioned, the uh, people I was, my kind of colleagues that I discussed with, they really just recommended whatever um, works well for you. If you're able to consistently walk and make a good habit, habit, habit out of it, you can see here there's a significant amount of benefit that you gain from it. The second portion of that American Heart Association was talking about cholesterol and not everybody has issues with cholesterol, but I think it um, is beneficial to just discuss it a little bit. Here's that um, infographic from them again. The I think the big points is that you don't just get cholesterol from the foods that you eat. You know, your body does also make them and there's healthier forms of, of fats that you can eat compared to um, more unhealthy forms. So there is a certain portion where you can really affect it by your diet. But to a certain point, depending on your family history or your background, there's only so much that you can do there. And despite your best efforts, there might still be a reason why we would recommend that you be on a medication. And we know that it's not as simple as um, a high cholesterol number means increased risk of heart disease. There's a lot more 
uh, process that goes on in the formation of that plaque that I was talking about earlier. Inflammation, um, generalized just in regards to your genetics, but you at higher risk too. So even if you do have uh, high cholesterol, there actually is further testing that we sometimes pursue to make sure that you're actually somebody who has an indication to be on a medication. But the simple part of it is that the good cholesterol that we talk about is the HDL. That's the one that when it flows through the blood vessels, it actually kind of globs onto the other cholesterol and pulls it out. And then the LDL is the one that we know is associated with forming those plaques in the arteries. So that's the one that we want to avoid. The, the triglycerides, I don't think there's much that we need to kind of go through here. I think the biggest thing that you should just know about is that it's important that uh, usually there's there's standard screening recommendations that we do for cholesterol. And aside from, you know, if you do get prescribed a medication, I would really strongly suggest that you, you make sure and take that every day, that you have good follow up with your primary care provider, or if you do have a cardiologist, your cardiologist. And that we do monitor those levels routinely to make sure that we're really reducing your risk of heart disease as best as we can. And these uh, kind of points over here are really going to be stressed over and over again about eating healthy, being more active, uh, knowing which fats are more healthy, which we'll talk about a little bit more actually during the, the diet portion, um, avoiding smoking, and then taking that medication like we were talking about. The you know, I have uh, quite a few patients ask me about fish oil, and if we prescribe them medication, uh, especially one of them called statins, which I'm sure quite a few of you have heard about before. They're, in general, um, statins are were quite a miracle drug when they came out. They provide a significant amount of benefit in regards to reducing people's chance of having heart disease. So a lot of the time, if we start somebody on a, a statin, it's not uncommon that they've known somebody who has uh, muscle or body aches from them. That's kind of the most, I would say, feared complication or adverse effect that comes from them. But in my clinical practice, I honestly have not had a significant amount of patients actually have that side effect. It's quite low. You know, the data shows that it's less than 1% of people. And I do know that the benefit that you would get from it if you're able to tolerate it or not have any side effects is quite high. So I really stress that if you've been recommended that you start one, I would, you know, try to take it. And if you do have side effects, there's lots of other ones that we can try along it, alongside it. But I, there is good data for how much benefit you get from it. So I think it's very important. But I've had a lot of patients ask me about fish oil. And if they could just take fish oil instead of um, their statin or in addition to. And honestly, there, there's some data that fish oil can be beneficial but it's in large quantities, like not just the fish oil pills that you get at Costco or at any place. You have to intake a significant amount of fish oil, more so than most anybody would normally take. And the benefit has been kind of debated on if it's really there. So I would say, you know, if you're taking it, there's probably no harm in it, but it's not something as part of our kind of um, agreed upon guidelines that, you know, it's not like I recommend it to for every patient to take. And if there was good data behind it, then we would be doing that because we, as I mentioned, we wanna prevent this as best as we can. Not a lot else aside from uh, diet to mention about the cholesterol. In regards to eating better, you know, there's the whole uh, kind of my plate movement that came out that talks about eating a lot more vegetables compared to uh, red meats and sugary foods and, this is kind of a, a generalized spread here is half your meal should be about vegetables, which I know I'm even um, bad at sometimes is making sure that I get, I get enough vegetables, but at least aiming for that and not feeling bad if you don't make that goal. You know, I think I wouldn't put a lot of stock in, you know, beating yourself up if you're not eating the best diet. I think it just gives you a chance to improve on those things. But here's their uh, American Heart Association's infographic here. So there's a few other things that we'll talk about aside from just this uh, this slide here, but it really is, it's not super complicated. I'll be honest with you, you know, these these kind of fad diets and all of these things, I I don't really love if if they work for you and you've lost weight, that is all well, well and good. It, you just have to find something that you're consistent with. You know, if you do find this, um, 
diet that works really well for you, whatever it may be, if it's low carb, low calorie, um, you know, the whole. I, I'm not going <laughs> to outright recommend that uh, people do like a keto diet or anything like that. But if you find a diet because it's not super, it's usually not super heavy on uh, vegetables. But if you find something that helps you lose weight, that's wonderful. It's just finding something that's more consistent. Like you don't want to have a diet that you kind of bounce in and out of. You go on it for three months and you lose weight and then you kind of rebound because you went back to your normal habits. You really want to get something that's sustainable. And focusing really on vegetables, whole grains, lean meats like fish and chicken, uh, and kind of minimizing the amount of red meat as well as sugary foods that you that you eat is really in your best interest. Um, you know, eggs are okay. There, I know there's that's always gone back and forth, especially with uh, cardiologists on if we recommend it, if it messes with your cholesterol, etc. They are fine <laughs> to eat, especially you know like a a hard boiled egg is a very good, healthy uh, snack for you. It's got a lot of protein, not super calorie heavy. heavy. Um, and then pretty simple as well. I think everybody knows this. It's not mind blowing to try to avoid um, kind of commercially baked goods, fried foods, things that are really heavy in sugar. One thing that I do find with my patients is that I think people are pretty surprised when they actually monitor and count their calories. So it's it's actually, um, you, you know, when you're looking, and I'm sure you've you've all heard this before, but paying attention to serving sizes is important because I'm a, I'm a big fan of everything in moderation. I don't think there's an absolute no that you shouldn't have any of these things. You should just be conscious of it. You know, if you're going to have a brownie or a cookie, I think that's fine as long as you're just conscious about you're not that's not the main thing that you eat most days and then being aware of you know if you do have that packaged whatever it might be if it's one cookie and it says on the back that it's 80 calories and that's four servings in one cookie then that's you know 320 calories that you're getting there and it adds up very quickly i think just looking at labels and um i've had a lot of patients be successful with a lot of different um calorie counting applications on their phone. I know not everybody has a smartphone, so that's not always kind of feasible, but everybody can hopefully at least or have someone help them look at the calorie content on uh, a label. But tracking your calories can be very helpful and provide a lot of uh, helpful information because I've had patients come back and say, oh, once I actually started tracking my calories, I recognized like I'm eating so much more than what I actually thought that I was. And it makes it a little bit easier to pick out maybe what the more high calorie foods are and eliminate those. I think everybody knows that eating at home or cooking at home is usually uh, more nutritionally dense and uh, lower calories over all in general. And then there are just this little section that we'll mention a little bit is, and this is more for high blood pressure and things, but these are all very high in salt. So we're talking about breads, rolls, a lot of the packaged um, pastries and things like that have a lot of salt in them pizza, cold cuts and cured meats, um, as well as, I mean, really any packaged foods, be it, um, you know, chips, crackers, et cetera, or even packaged frozen food can. Um, I'm trying to think of the, like the bird's eye, those kind of prepared meals. All of those have a lot of sodium in them, so that really would help to just be aware of kind of the things that you're putting in your body. And it's sometimes surprising, like I said, when people are looking more the only reason I have this here is, um, you know, the one diet that actually has good data for generalized heart health is is really the Mediterranean diet. So just a tiny bit of context about the Mediterranean diet. It was actually just people found it in regards to looking back and seeing that people who actually live in this region, you know, France, Italy, Spain, et cetera, Greece had lower incidence or they didn't have as much heart disease as a lot of other places did. So they kind of looked back and found that it's actually because they eat a, a diet that's more focused on plants and vegetables. Um, beans and fruits, as well as nuts, are all you know, very healthy options here. Olive oil being kind of a main source of fat in this diet, 
which is an unsaturated diet there, unsaturated fat, which is much better than the saturated. And then fish, seafood, and dairy are included in moderation. You know, it's really the um, red meat is also not um, strongly recommended here either. But this is one diet that actually has a lot of good data showing that people have lower rates of heart disease with this. So it's one that if you're not familiar with, if you even just Google it, you'll get a lot of um, information discussing options or um, recipe recommendations. There's kind of one other uh, diet that, and the, I actually I just included some um, pictures of kind of examples of meals here, not to like go through exactly what's in here, but you can kind of see there's a nice color variation here. We have mostly vegetables, some fruits, lean chicken here, avocado, there's some sweet potato, chickpeas, kale, tomatoes here with feta cheese, radishes, here's some farro with some, looks like I think tomatoes, but all, you know, very healthy options overall. The only other diet that has really been shown beneficial with the heart is it's called the DASH diet. You might have had a physician mention it to you before. The acronym stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And it really emphasizes fruits and vegetables and then really limiting your sodium, which I find that most patients get high amounts of sodium from packaged foods. You know, I'll, I'll hear it over and over again. That I don't add any salt to my food, but you just have to be conscious of what where you're getting your salt from, because it's usually not from you adding it. I did think um, I'll actually I'll open this real quick. Won't take very much time. Just let me verify if you guys can see this on my screen. The uh, the MyPlate website. I don't know if you can, Jennifer. Let me make sure that it's here. Yes, I can see it. Great, perfect, thank you. So I, it's not a lot I was gonna, a lot of time spent here. I think this is a very nice resource. It's myplate.gov and it, it has a lot of good options here. So if you're not familiar with what kind of choices that you should make or that could be potentially healthy for you. So like, let's say we just click on the vegetables here. It'll show you how much you should be eating. It'll give you examples here. Uh, so. If we look at this cup of vegetable table, it has a very large, robust table here talking about how much of a sweet potato counts as a serving, all of these kind of different things to make sure that you're getting enough vegetables in your diet. And there's actually an application that goes with this MyPlate that I haven't personally used, so I'm not, um, I can't speak to it very much, but um, I've had patients use it and find it quite helpful. But I thought I'd just show that I actually think it's a very good resource for people if you're interested in kind of finding healthy foods and getting good options for yourself and are not really sure where to start. Uh, managing your blood pressure is always very important. Kind of one of the other of those seven that we talked about. And just so people are familiar, because I know that not everybody is in regards to what kind of normal number numbers are for your blood pressure, because it's not uncommon. I've had people tell me that you know, when they've gotten their blood pressure measured, it's always um, good. And then when I kind of ask what what good is, sometimes it is up in this range of 130s to almost 140s. And that is quite high, honestly. We do usually want our goal to be less than 120 for that top number and, and 80 for the bottom number. Those are just called systolic and diastolic, just talking about when the heart's pumping when we measure that. And then you can see here, higher than 180 is very, very elevated. Um, Sometimes we actually give people, you know, medications acutely to get that uh, blood pressure down when it's at those those kind of levels. But it's important to have this checked pretty routinely. This goes through uh, practically the same thing. There's not a lot aside from understanding that blood pressure plays a large role in the health of your heart. You know, your heart doesn't get happy when the pressure that it's pumping against, if it's really, really elevated, you know, the heart has to work really hard and over a period of time, even if you're not getting any symptoms from the blood pressure, a lot of the time, you know, if we're in this range, 130, 140, people aren't going to feel that. You won't get any pain or dizziness or any real symptoms from that. But we do know that the arteries aren't happy about it, as well as the heart. 
you know, the heart has to work harder when it's pumping against that elevated pressure. So even despite maybe someone not having symptoms from it, it does uh, have pretty significant ramifications for the health of your heart as well as for your arteries in the long term. Um, the big things are making sure that we check it. You know, everybody's now familiar with what kind of good numbers are, but making sure and check it. And then diet, exercise, uh, losing weight, not smoking are all ways that uh, lower that blood pressure. You know, sleeping is also very important. Sometimes sleep apnea um, is significantly associated with elevated blood pressure, and we do routinely screen patients who have very high blood pressure for possible sleep apnea, because that could be causing you to have high blood pressure if you do have sleep apnea. So if you have sleep apnea and you have a CPAP, it's always important to use that routinely as well. Uh, here's just a couple of examples of different monitors. You know, people have the arm cuff, the wrist, and this is the old one that you probably don't see that much because everybody's stuck inside now. But uh, for checking it, kind of the store, the little kiosk. All of these are fine. Um, the Technically speaking, the arm cuff is usually a little bit more accurate, but it, I'm always happy when somebody comes into the office and they've actually kind of made out this little chart. So if you do have high blood pressure, I, I would recommend at least recording this every now and then, you know, a couple times a week or once a week is even fine. But you record the date, the time, your top and bottom number, and then your pulse. And you can even put how you're feeling at that time. Or if you find a correlation like, man, my blood pressure is high and last night I did eat Chinese food or I ate out or whatever it might be. But sometimes that context is a little bit helpful. But I actually, I really appreciate when people come in with data like this. It's very helpful for us in making kind of the best decision about what medications or even just diet and exercise to recommend. So I thought it'd be nice to see an example of that. One of the other kind of seven is weight loss. And there's not a lot of um, crazy science here either. It's reducing how much we're eating and then increasing how active we are. So as we talked about before, counting your calories can be very helpful because it'll give you an idea about how much you're actually taking in. So that part is kind of addressed here. And then being more active in whatever way you find is, is beneficial for you or easiest for you. Because honestly, in general, humans and people, we're just, we're kind of lazy. So you have to find something that's easy for you to do or that you're going to do. That's what's so hard about making something a habit. So we need to make things as easy for ourselves as possible to be successful. And as I mentioned before, I, I don't put a lot of stock in. I don't think there's a lot of benefit in beating yourself up if you're not meeting the goals that you've set. It's really just if you're trying and you're attempting at it, I think that's a win by itself. You don't have to, if you say you want to lose 10 pounds by you know this date and you don't, but you lost five, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That is 100% a win to me. The, the BMI is a number that we use frequently. It's based on your height as well as your weight. I don't think we need to really discuss that. Aside from uh, the big parts here are is that our goal BMI for adults is 18 to 25, and then a waist circumference less than 40 in men and 35 in women. It's just because these numbers have been shown to reduce our risks of heart disease. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to get you a copy of the blood pressure chart. And there's also, um, you know, if you Google like blood pressure record chart, you'll get a ton of different examples that you can even just print at home that are very, very similar. But we can see if we can just get um, one of those sent out as well to everybody who attended. In regards to weight loss, usually five to 10% uh, weight loss is, um, can have a significant effect on people's blood pressure, um, increasing their good cholesterol, the HDL we were talking about, as well as reducing your risk of um, diabetes in the future. So even, uh, and 10% can be a lot though. I mean, I'm not saying that's um, easy or that it's gonna be something you can do really quickly, but know that that can really have a, a significant effect in how um, the quality of your life is gonna be going uh, forward. Uh, reducing blood sugar is another one of those seven. So really the, I think the big things to understand about sugar in the blood, and I'll actually, I have a little chart or a slide next, where we'll talk a little bit more about it. But the long and the short is that glucose is blood sugar. You know, when you get your 
blood drawn and we tell you that your glucose is this, or people may have heard of an A1C, and an A1C is a three month average of how much uh, sugar has been in the blood, and that's how we determine one from just the sugar in the blood as well as that A1C is if someone actually has, um, if they're non-diabetic, pre-diabetic, or if they have um, actual diabetes. And insulin is the hormone that your body, uh, that's made in the pancreas, that manages your glucose. So it's the actual thing that causes the glucose to shift from in the arteries to into the cell so your body can actually use it. And the problem with diabetes is either a type 1 problem where you don't make any insulin or a type 2 diabetes problem where you've made insulin so much for such a long period of time that your body doesn't, rec doesn't react appropriately to it anymore. It starts to ignore it because it gets, um, it's not as sensitive to it. You get resistant to the insulin. So and all um, these are kind of normal. It's probably hard for you to see. This is a very small chart here. But the normal range is less than 100. 100 to 125 is in the pre-diabetic range. And if we were to stick your finger in your blood sugar when you haven't eaten, you've been fasting, is greater than 126, that indicates that you um, potentially could have diabetes. And then we would do more screening for that. And as I said before, it's really kind of the same kind of stuff eating better, moving more. Um, we talked about the weight losses would potentially benefit this significantly. And oh, let me go back. And actually, I think I might have switched. OK, no, the view's fine, I think. Yeah. Um, I was going to do a tiny little uh, graphic here. So just to explain a little bit about the, so here's our artery. We have cells outside of it, okay. I'm gonna make a tiny little opening here. This is the, let me get this color changed. So these are just the red blood cells, as I mentioned. This is inside the artery. I'm not an artist, I don't claim to be, so go easy on me here. But, you know, let's say the blood is flowing this direction. And then I'll show you a couple different things here. If we do, so we're gonna make this sugar. Okay, I'm gonna put some of these in here. So this is the blood sugar that we're measuring, that finger stick or the blood glucose that we see. It's all running around in here. And then I'm gonna make a little triangle and that's going to represent insulin. So as I talked about, this is the hormone that's made by the pancreas. It's secreted into your, your bloodstream. And when it's present, um, initially when your body responds normally to it, it actually opens up this little pathway and it actually allows your body to uptake the sugar from the blood and then that sugar is inside the blood cell, uh, is inside the body's cells. So this is what your, you know, your cells actually need. They need the energy to grow, to do their normal kind of processes. But without the insulin present, you know, if one, as I mentioned, if you don't have any from type one diabetes, then there's none of this insulin present. And then the, the blood is just filled with sugar all the time, which is very irritating. You know, the arteries don't like it. Your body doesn't like it. It's inflammatory. It's not good for anything. So that's the type one setting. And the type two, you've had so much insulin present all the time. You know, we're eating all the time. Uh, your blood sugar is spiking. Your body starts to ignore because it says, hey, that insulin's around all the time. I don't really care about it anymore. And your body now needs significantly more insulin to eventually get that sugar into the cells, which is what your body wants. But those are kind of the, I just thought it'd be helpful to do a little graphic about how the sugar gets moved into your cell so you can actually use it in kind of type one as well as type two diabetes. These are the changes that can happen with your sugar. So this is obviously nothing, we didn't do anything. And this is the uh, incidence of diabetes in patients over years. So as we go to the right, this is over time. And this is the percent of people who've gotten diabetes who are at risk for it. So over time, if we do nothing, we know that 
people will eventually get it if you start metformin, which is a very good medication for pre-diabetics as well as diabetics. It can reduce your risk significantly from not doing anything. But look here, actually lifestyle, healthy food choices, being active, losing weight, all of those things have significantly more effect than anything else, which I think is pretty, I think it gives you a lot of control over kind of your health uh, as, as much as you can kind of have, knowing that if you make these changes, you can make really good uh, benefits for yourself. Um, quitting tobacco is also very important. There's not a, we'll talk about a little bit here. It's not super long, but there's no, um, no studies have shown that we have a safe level of uh, smoking. So no amount of, you know, especially coming from being a heart doctor, I can't recommend any safe level of tobacco use. Even one cigarette per day increases your risk of heart disease by about 48%. And one pack per day uh, approximately doubles your risk. So, you know, aside from all those other things, having, and it's not easy to quit tobacco, but um, know that you would do yourself significant benefit by doing that. Or if you have a loved one who smokes, not saying you should wag your finger at them or tell them that they're doing anything bad. I think that we get into these habits and they're very difficult to break. But I think understanding the amount of benefit that you could actually give yourself or potentially give yourself from uh, stopping tobacco. So really we're, the recommendation is no tobacco use and avoiding any secondhand smoke. This is the infographic from them. It talks about um, it being one of the most preventable causes of death in the US. There's a lot of kind of things here. I don't think I need to uh, read through every one of them. But I think one of the important parts, and you can kind of read through here while I'm blathering on, but making a plan to quit is, I think this is actually, this setting a quit date within seven days is pretty difficult to, to do that and be successful with it, at least in my experience. But I do think that setting a date has a, a symbolic meaning in someone's mind as well about when they want to quit. Uh, in regards to the question in regards to smoking. So, you know, at this point, um, and the question is, uh, in smoking, do you distinguish between smoking cigarettes as opposed to vaping marijuana? Currently, uh, there's not enough data that we can comfortably say one is different than the other, one is worse. I, I can tell you that there's not the same amount of carcinogens and uh, amount of different products that are actually present in cigarettes compared to marijuana. But currently there's not any um, recommendations for the American Heart Association or from kind of the medical community in regards to safe levels of um, vaping or smoking marijuana either. But um, yeah, hopefully that answered the question. And I do think that these kind of steps here are pretty beneficial for people. And as I mentioned, this is really the kind of same kind of sections again being active uh the one thing i found with some uh, patients is dealing with the urges is sometimes it's um it's even the motion of smoking a cigarette and sometimes uh chewing a gum can be helpful or if it's nicotine gum or i've actually even seen like the little nicotine um just devices that have nicotine there's no tobacco present at them when people are trying to wean themselves off, as well as even putting a block. I've had patients tie or put rubber bands around their um, packs of cigarettes. So when they reach for them, when they're trying to quit, they kind of recognize there's that whole motion of having to remove the, the band and it gives them a pause to really think about they're wanting to quit and give them another chance to kind of stop there. And then in regards to the question of uh, wondering if wrist, cuff, for blood pressure or an arm cuff is better for at home use. I would say that both are acceptable. You know, if you come in to the office or the clinic and you tell me I use this cuff or the other cuff, both of them are gonna be completely fine. Technically speaking, the arm cuff is a little bit more accurate just based on um, how they function. It works a little bit more accurately. So I usually recommend the, um, the arm cuff, but if I have a patient who already has a wrist cuff, I don't tell them to go buy an, an arm cuff if they already have a wrist cuff. So uh, the only, actually these are, and these are kind of my last points here. 
I've had um, some patients ask me about alcohol use and if it's good for their heart or if it's not good for their heart or if they should, you know, the whole thought of a glass of wine, et cetera, can be heart healthy. So there's, um, and I'll, I'll address the, uh, the question in the chat in just a second. In regards to alcohol, there's actually this J curve. So um, you can see here, current alcohol consumption drinks per week. This is obviously a very large amount. 50 drinks per week is a lot. Uh, the normal recommended amount for people, for men, is no more than two a day and women no more than one a day, just for a reference. But um, this is the chance of all cause mortality or, or dying. And you can actually see here with a very small amount of alcohol use, there's actually a, a slight lowering in, and we don't know exactly what this is from. And as I mentioned, it is kind of a J curve. So there's a very fine window where the thought is that there's some potential benefit from alcohol. And once you get past that point, it is detrimental for your overall health. It's, it's kind of a fine line here. So what I usually recommend for my patients is I don't ever recommend anyone to start drinking if they don't. But if you do use it infrequently and in you know appropriate quantities, I don't say that you have to stop either just because of this information. So hopefully that addresses or help, helps give some perspective about that. And then I don't know if anybody um, has heard the whole there's been a lot of data about aspirin, especially over the last couple of years. And I, I still have patients who come in and they tell me, you know, I'm on an aspirin because I'm over 40. My doctor started me on it years and years and years ago. The thing I would point out there is that our newest guidelines say that not everybody should be taking aspirin. Uh, the heart benefit and the risk of bleeding are not equivalent. So if we were to put everybody on aspirin, we know that we would cause some people to have um, bleeds in their stomach where they need to come into the hospital, et cetera. So actually the, the newest guidelines do not recommend just because you reach a certain age that you start on an aspirin. But if you've had a heart event in the past, a stroke, you have diabetes, usually there's other reasons why you could also be started on aspirin, but not everybody should take aspirin i think is just the point that i wanted to make there because that is that used to be a thing and it's um kind of fallen out of favor with the, the data that we have and then uh, another question here oh yeah so could high hdl decrease with age it potentially can as well as with uh dietary changes so depending on i think it'd be hard to assess if pat you had eaten the exact same diet over that period of time. That's very possible that you did, but those things can change. And then the second part is, if a person has had low blood pressure for a long time, could it increase suddenly? And if so, what could cause this? That's an interesting uh, question. I think that there's a couple portions there. I would, I need to ask you a couple more <laughs> questions, but sometimes if those are all home, I don't know if those are home readings that you're referring to, but sometimes if somebody has um, kind of spurious readings like that, I actually recommend that they come into our blood pressure clinic or even they bring their blood pressure cuff to their primary care office and they can verify if the measurements have been accurate and having that done in a couple different places. You know, if you're getting it all from one cuff, maybe ask for your friend's cuff or come into the office and get a measurement to actually verify that they are um, elevated. And then Another, I mean, there's a lot of other reasons there, but it could also do to weight changes as well. Or, um, you know, as we discussed earlier, there is associations of sleep apnea with high blood pressure. And I've actually, sorry, I had to just adjust my socks. <laughs> I've had uh, patients who have high blood pressure and actually just get started on their, you know, that CPAP machine that helps uh, for portions of time when you're not breathing at night. I've actually had them start on those and completely come off all of their blood pressure medications, you know, be it one or two different ones that they're on just because they're actually getting the therapy for the thing that's causing the high blood pressure. So there could be there could be a lot of different things there. Um, I don't think I can give you a, a perfect answer. Let me I just want to see if to remind myself what else I had here. OK, that is that's all I had. 
and then I'll, I'll go through the rest of these kind of questions here as well. Um, is there any counter indicators for long term stat use, especially for women? And I think counter indicators. Um, and Stacy, are you referring to like, is that contraindications, the counter indicators? Oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, no, so there are um, specific contraindications for taking statin and the, that term. If anybody's not familiar, contraindication means it's a reason to never ever give that medication or that treatment um, or that therapy. So, you know, if somebody's had anaphylaxis where you have this full body reaction to, let's say, penicillin, because that's a common um, antibiotic that people have heard of and people um, have probably heard of others with allergies. But let's say you had an anaphylactic reaction to it, then in that person, that would be um, that in that person, that would be contraindicated to give to that person. So the question being, are there any contraindications for long term statin use, especially for women? Really, aside from you having a reaction to it, like a profound reaction, I'm saying it's called um, rhabdomyolysis is the, the severe allergy or reaction someone can have to it. That would technically be one. But in general, there aren't for women. It, it could be particularly in certain people, though, depending on what conditions or what other medications. There are some medications that we don't like to mix with them. But, you know, the pharmacists as well as the physicians hopefully do a good job of really reviewing that before starting them. But in general, no, there's not long term. Um, there's not contraindications to long term statin use. Uh, for Pat, has anyone looked into if genetics had an impact on low heart disease in the Mediterranean region in addition to diet? So that's a good question. There um, is a portion there that does associate with that as well. They have found, at least when they kind of analyze the subsets of patients and people, that the diet at least had some portion of significance. Because I think you're pointing out a common thing that happens in looking at populations or studies is looking at something that's, is it correlated or is it is it a cause or is it just there because it's also, um, the whole setting is congruent with it. But there, um, Overall, it seems like the, the diet was more the, the biggest factor there. And there's actually kind of a whole health to, um, there's a whole health mentality that's actually different in that kind of region. It's all about being active and those people in general are, um, do more walking and exercising than the general population. They also like to eat with families which a lot of the time nowadays, you know, we kind of sit down in front of the television and eat, be it alone or not talking with your loved one. And it's been shown that there is some benefit. I can't tell you the, the amount of benefit that's there from doing those activities, but it does slow you down in your eating and maybe make you more conscious of, of what you're putting into your body. But there is kind of a different attitude about life in that region compared to, to other ones as well. And let me, I just want to look if there's any hands? OK, not right now. Uh, other question, though, I think I saw. How exactly does too much sugar in the blood damage the body from Anne? That's a good question as well. So the it's actually a very uh, complicated mechanism for why the sh the high amounts of sugar. And let me actually then like, flip back real quick. So. All of this sugar is it's very irritating. You know, your body's not used to always having and by irritating, I really refer to inflammation and we're really getting down into the details here about the process by what that why that happens is is the the high amounts of sugar are very inflammatory to the the tissue in the artery and it causes a large surge of kind of inflammatory markers in your body. It's been shown that people with diabetes have higher states of inflammation in their body. The, the exact mechanism goes down to kind of the, the molecular level there. 
So that's kind of the long and the short is that your body is not used to seeing sugar all the time. You know, there's periods of time when we used to not have any food in our body, but now with the, the ease of access to food as well as high sugary kind of foods, it's very easy to kind of graze throughout the day and you kind of keep your blood sugar elevated all throughout the day when that's really not the normal that your body is used to seeing. It usually gets periods of time where there's not a lot and your liver starts to make more sugar for you versus you all getting it just from eating as well. So hopefully that helped. Uh, Maggie, she says, I've always had low blood pressure. I recently had a streak of blood pressure, 140 over 90 or so. The doctor put me on a low dose of blood pressure medication. Can we get off the medications with lifestyle change? I would say the chance that you could is very, very high. I've had a lot of patients who are in a very similar circumstance to you where their blood pressure has always been good and be it for whatever reason, maybe it's changes in diet. I don't know if you've gained any weight recently or your activity levels have changed, but after we know that that blood pressure and that 140 over 90, as we discussed, that's definitely in the range where we want to make it as easy for your heart to pump fluid and as less inflammatory as we can for the whole system. So I think it seems appropriate um, that you got started on those medications, but it's very, very likely that you could get off them in the future. You know, the as we discussed, the exercise, the five to 10% uh, weight loss can be very beneficial. And one of the big ones for the diet, I don't know if they, hopefully they talked about this with you, is the, uh, where do I have it? Is this DASH diet? I would, I would actually recommend that if you even just Google the DASH diet, it will give you a lot of recommendations of foods to avoid that can cause high blood pressure, as well as good foods to eat more of to help with your blood pressure. That's, good, that's great news that you had the stress test and it all looked good. Yeah, and you know, with everybody not working, um, people's activity levels went down. Um, you know, a lot of people put on a little bit of extra weight because we're eating a little bit more while we're sitting around at home too. But yeah, I, I think this is um, this can be very helpful. I've, ha I've had people make really good changes with the DASH diet. And then Pat, we have, has there been any, an increase in heart disease or heart attacks during the pandemic? If so, has stress been a factor? That's a very good point, Jennifer. <laughs> um, the, I'll sit here. Um, they're actually, it's an interesting question, Pat. So there has been a lot of, it has seemed like there's been a higher amount of people with heart attacks. I don't have the data strictly saying that anecdotally it has seemed that way. And I do think it's actually interesting because our hospitals don't have enough staff. It's actually really difficult to get the care that you need. You know, we're actually taking care of people with heart attacks in a much different way than we used to, just because sometimes we don't even have a spot available for somebody in the hospital come, to come over from Albany or from Lebanon or from the coast, and they end up sitting there waiting longer. And we get treated with medications, but sometimes it delays the actual um, care that they need. So, yeah. Um, and then from Anne, what is the recommended amount of salt we should try to have in our diet? Yeah, and I hopefully you saw on that uh, slide here. I'll pop back. It's about 2300 on the DASH diet right here. 2300 milligrams of sodium a day. More than that has been shown to really affect your blood pressure significantly, especially if any of you have um, kidney disease, that you do have altered uh, management of your own sodium. So I'd be highly conscious of how much sodium you're taking in a day if that's the case. Oh, and then to clarify on um, your question, Pat, sorry, I'm not meaning to like slide through this, go through these slides over and over again, but um, in regard, stress does um, have an effect on the heart. There is actually a, a process where people actually can have something similar to a heart attack, but it's called stress-induced uh, cardiomyopathy is the term, or Takotsubo. It's a stress, it's a complete mind-body connection where you've had so much stress in your life, be it physical or emotional, that it actually can cause the heart to go into kind of a, a severe form of a reaction to that. That's not super common, but it does um, happen not infrequently. We do see people in the hospital with it. And then as Jennifer mentioned, yeah, as we're wrapping up, there's that link to the survey. 
I would appreciate, and I think the whole team would appreciate if you guys uh, get a chance to fill that out. And I'm more than happy if anyone has any other uh, questions about anything. Hopefully that information was helpful and gave you some good stuff to think about and work on going forward. OK. Well, thanks everybody for spending time with us and I appreciate your questions and your interaction. It makes doing these a little bit more engaging and fun. So. Well, thanks again, everybody. Um, appreciate your time and your interaction. Hope you have everybody has a good rest of their day.